Today's summation of belief is on our stewardship. God's intention for mankind is that we serve Him as faithful stewards of His creation. We are to invest the time, talents, and material possessions God has given us for His kingdom work, knowing that God is the true owner of all we have and that our true treasure is found not on earth, but in heaven. Motivated by God's generosity to us, made most clear in the gospel, we are to give God the best of what we have, regularly, sacrificially, humbly, and cheerfully. We give while praying that God may be glorified in our stewardship of his provisions. Now I'll be reading now from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting with verse 6. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a, cheer a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all su sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission flowing from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of contribution for them and for all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you thanks be to the God thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift let's go to the Lord now in prayer father we praise you as creator and owner of everything Thank you for providing us 24 hours in a day and giving us talents all to glorify you. Thank you for individually supplying us material possessions uh, to be stewards over and to share with others, including the church. Thank you for giving our church's forefathers and current leaders this belief stewardship so that we have material possessions that we use to your glory. We thank you, Father, and Amen. Would you stand and let's sing together.
Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, regarding God's righteous judgment. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you were storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and will to him seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give you eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and, <clears throat> and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first, and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first, and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. In Christianity, repentance is the act of seeking forgiveness from God because we know that we have sinned against God. And knowing how sinful our words or actions or way of life have been, there is sincere remorse over it, which then motivates us to seek forgiveness from God through prayer. In other words, repentance is about valuing God over ourselves. It is about pleasing God and not our flesh. Repentance is a change of mind. It is seen as a return to the Lord by restoring one's faith in Him and turning away from the wicked ways of sin. A change in our minds must be accompanied by a change in the way we live our lives, our words, <coughs> And our actions. We can now prayer with this morning. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we have failed you in so many ways. We have judged <clears throat> our neighbors and not even lived up to our own standards. Our sins are many, and even our best is as filthy rags in your sight. Yet you have provided a way. For us to be forgiven so that when we humbly confess our sin, we can ask for your forgiveness. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for not abandoning us to our mistakes, but for reaching out instead to bring us home. Help convict us of our sin and help us accept your mercy without shame. Thank you for your the love that you have poured out for all of your children. Help us to turn from our sin and lead us to walk in your way instead. For it is in Jesus' name and for your praise and glory we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus died for ungodly sinners. And none of us deserve what he did for us. But as a forgiving God, the Lord will always welcome us back into his arms unconditionally. Sometimes the weight of our sins may cause us to feel as if we were beyond redemption. But that is not true because no amount of sin is a big enough reason to make our Heavenly Father stop loving us. He is just and merciful. When we confess our sins through our prayer of repentance, the Lord will show us unconditional forgiveness. You see, God has made it possible for us, His children,
to come boldly to the throne of grace, even after we have sinned. We can draw near with confidence in spite of our shame at having failed. Why? Because Christ, by his death on the cross, presents us holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. When we sin, if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us. In Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 8, we are provided an assurance of pardon. And it reads, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us.
around at our community. As we look around at our church family, we recognize that there are some that are not with us today because they are either traveling or they are not well. There are some that are not with us today because of heartaches. There are a variety of reasons that we don't always gather together, but we who are gathered together should lift up in prayer those who cannot be with us. So with that in mind, let's pray together today. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we are allowed to come together in this place. We are thankful that we are allowed to assemble while sickness continues to go throughout our country and even our own city, we're thankful that it is easier and easier to interact with others these days. But Father, we know that in our own community there is a great number of people who are affected by an explosion that took place. There are a number of families that no longer have a home there are a number of families that cannot enter their home because their homes are no longer safe. And while life is more than our possessions, our lives are rocked when those possessions are taken away. We ask, Father, that not only would community agencies step up to help, we ask not only that you would show us how we can Come alongside those who are in need. We pray ultimately, Lord, that you would intercede. That you would make yourself known. Father, we are grateful for instances of healing that we've seen. We're thankful for knowing that Kaylin is doing better after her surgery. We're thankful that Jackie Johnston's mother is doing so much better, Lord. And I thank you that you did it in a way that it brought glory to yourself, Lord, that it was literally the very next day after the church prayed for her. We continue to pray for Beulah that she would get stronger. We're thankful that we've heard that Hank Haggard has been able to go home. And yet we know that him and Valerie both need recuperation. We pray that you would strengthen their bodies, that they can go about doing the work that they need to do. We praise you, Lord, that I'm Jim McConnell can be with us today. We pray, Lord, for Juanita, who is struggling in, in a variety of different ways with her health, Lord, in the way that that is affecting her day-to-day -day life. We lift up our children as they return to school, asking that you would help them to grow not only in knowledge, but to grow in wisdom, and give them discerning minds to be able to discern what is right and true and what is false. Father, we also pray for our children that have grown, for we never stop being concerned for them. We ask that you would be with their health. We pray for Jacob Sweat, Father, that you would intervene with his life and his day-to-day -day circumstances, both in his control and out of his control. Lord, we ask that you would show yourself to be strong. We pray for Danny James. Asking, Lord, that you would continue to work in his heart and work in him and through him for your pleasure. We pray, Father, for our church. That we would never be so distracted by the day-to-day -day activities, Lord, that we would fail to be doing the mission that you've called us to do to make disciples. And we pray, Lord, not that you would do this, that we might be comforted. We pray not that you would do this, that we might have more. But we pray that you would do this for the glory of your great name. 
or we want to see the name of Jesus Christ lifted up. And we want more people worshiping you. So we ask all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. fell 
asleep, and while he was sleeping, she took a, took a tin peg, put it against his temple, grabbed a hammer, and drove the tin peg into the ground and killed him. That was chapter 4. Here's the song of Judges chapter 4. Judges chapter 5. <coughs> Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, that the leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes, to the Lord I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Sire, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. The travelers kept to the byways. The villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I arose, I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. When new gods were chosen, then war was in the gates. Was shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 in Israel? My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless the Lord. Tell of it. You who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, and you who walk by the way to the sound of musicians at the watering places, there they repeat the righteous triumphs of the Lord, the righteous triumphs of his villagers in Israel. Then down to the gates march the people of the Lord. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, break out in song, arise, bear Lead away your captives, O son of Aminoah. Then down marched the remnant of the noble. The people of the Lord marched down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim, their roots, they marched down into the valley, following you, Benjamin, with your kinsmen. From Nacher marched down the commanders. And from Zebulun, those who bear the lieutenant staff, the princes of Ishkar came with Deborah, and Ishkar faithful to Barak. To the valley they rushed at his heels. Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Why did you sit still among the sheepfolds to hear the whistling for the flocks? Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And Dan, why did he stay with the ships? Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, staying by his landings. Zebulun is a people who risked their lives to death. Naphtali, too, on the heights of the field. The kings came, they fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan to Anak. By the waters of Megiddo, they got no spoils of silver from heavens. The stars fought from their courses. They fought against Sisera. The torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon, march on my soul with might. Then loud beat the horse's hooves with the galloping, galloping of his steeds. Curse morose, says the angel <coughs> of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants thoroughly because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Herbert the Kenite, of ten dwelling women most blessed. He asked water and she gave him milk. She brought him curds in a noble's bowl. She sent her hand to the tin tank and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet, he sank. He fell. He lay still. Between her feet, he sank. He fell. There he fell, dead. Out of the window, she peered. The mother of Sisera wailed through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeat 
weeks of his chariots. Her wisest princesses answered. Indeed, she answers herself, have they not found and divided the spoil? A womb or two for every man, spoil of dyed materials for Sisera, spoil of dyed materials embroidered, two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the net as spoil? So may all your enemies perish, O Lord, but your friends be like the sun as he rises in his might. And the land had rest for forty years. Yesterday an event happened that while some of you, when I tell you the event that happened, might have a slight emotional reaction simply out of empathy, a few of us in this room, and I mean that word literally few, meaning three of us in this room, will have a genuine emotional reaction to this event that occurred yesterday. It shook me. I'm one of these bound emotionally people. Yesterday, the song Hail to the Redskins was retired and replaced with the song Hail to the Commanders. Now see, some of you are laughing. You think this is a funny thing. You are humored by this. Some of you might feel a little bit of grief in understanding the pain that three of us in this room are going through. And by three, I'm not talking my wife and child. <laughs> they may have some empathy, but they don't feel the pain that comes when the greatest fight song of all time is no more. <laughs> you might wonder how ridiculous I'm being right now. But when it's the song, not very, stop it. <laughs> but when it's the very song that spontaneously erupts from 70,000 people in unison at an event that happens, and you're a part of that group feeling that call to victory, you might understand. Now, for some of you, you'll never know what it's like to feel that when you hear na, 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 na. but some of you it's your college fight song some of you it's the music that gets played while players in blue run out bouncing an orange ball around aiming for a little hoop and you feel everything inside and you start to go oh it's on now yeah. You understand that when you go to the game, well, you're not watching at home, but you're actually at the game, and you start to hear, da 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 What person? I didn't know you had that. Well, I understand we're in church, but you dignify for that. But when you're there, it comes out. I've seen some of you at Aces games with the hope when they come out and the tears when you leave, right? I, I've seen but notice whenever they're trying to get the crowd involved, they don't just talk, it's music that's used. There's something about music that, that speaks in a way that mere words alone cannot speak. There, there's something about carrying that too. Now, some of you are musical people and some of you are not. If you're not a musical person, you just think that they arbitrarily bust out in song in random times throughout the play or the movie, and you're like, that's just ridiculous. Why did they burst out in song there? Here's the rule for musicals, for those of you who don't understand. For your normal day-to-day -day life, you can speak, but when the emotion rises, it must come out in song. Amen. That, the, the great songs are... It, it's, there's this music that comes out, and that's the part that you remember carrying on as you leave the theater. It's the music. Because it carries with it emotion and intellect weaved together into one package. And how amazing it is that in this dark, painful, ugly book, here at the beginning is a song. <coughs> A song that brings with it a group of subjects 
some of which we are familiar with in our songs, some of which seem very foreign and odd to us. It starts out there at the beginning. Notice Deborah and Barak are singing. And look at verse 2. That the leaders took the lead in Israel and that the people offered themselves willingly. They are singing about the reality that there were leaders and there were followers and they were in unison together. We, we've got some songs like that. You know, things like, bless me, you the tie that binds. And this idea of togetherness. But really what's being lifted up here is the fact that God has given leaders for his people. We see it in a number of different times throughout this. We see when Deborah rises up and we see her being called upon in verse 12. The way Deborah break out in song, Barak, lead away your captives. We, we see them being called by name. And to us, that's a foreign concept. When you go through our hymn books, there are not hymns that are written to specific leaders. I got thinking about this. I looked and I couldn't find it. There's no hymns in our hymn book singing about the greatness of Athanasius. And when I got thinking about this week, I was like, you know, that's almost a crime. Amen. I knew I'd get an amen. While there are songs written by Martin Luther in our hymn book, there are no songs about Martin Luther in our hymn book. While Spurgeon pointed us to hymns, there's no songs about the greatness of Charles Spurgeon. And I got thinking, well, if we carry that on, I think in my own life, why have I not written a song about the greatness of Pat Graham? Not the basketball player, he was a minister that I grew up with. So that's why you people here. Why is there no Pat Hank songs? Steve Russell songs? Should I be writing those? And I actually was thinking about it. Why is it that we've not written these songs to these great leaders? And finally, I'm slow, it hit me. Because we sing songs to the greatest leader. We don't write a song about Martin Luther because we have Jesus. We, we don't write about Athanasius because even Athanasius would say, don't write about me, write about Jesus. Write about the one that's greater. Now in these days, that this song that we have in Judges chapter 5 was being written, their leader, their salvation was coming through Deborah. But our salvation never came through Athanasius. Our salvation never walked through the halls of Martin Luther. Martin Luther and Athanasius and and Calvin and all of the great men of faith and women of faith only pointed us to the one that our ultimate salvation came. And they would not have us write songs about them. I would not have any songs written about me. If you see something great that I've been able to do for you, don't write it about me. Write it about the Savior who used us in this room, we don't need songs to ourselves. We don't need songs about our greatness. We need songs about our Savior. And that's what we have in our hymn book. We have lots of songs that simply want to point people to Jesus Christ because no matter what I can ever do for you, I will always fail you. That's the promise I can make. I will fail you at some point. I can let you down. But Jesus never will. Jesus never fails any of us. For the work that's necessary for you and me was already completed when he came. When he lived a sinless life. And here's a Savior that we can sing about. Not only did he walk this earth and live that sinless life, but he died for your sins and for mine. That was in the songs that we sang today. How great thou art. I mean, it's one of those songs that, I mean, just, it's, it, it's, you feel that song. And when I think that God is son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. And on the cross, I burned and gladly buried. He bled and died to take away my sin. And that, what, that next line is the only line that can follow. Then sings my 
soul. It's got to come out in song. They sing about their leaders, the ones who brought them salvation, and so should we. Notice there's something else really weird in here. But for our culture today, this scares some of us. But look there in verse, let's see, <coughs> verse 4. <coughs> Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled, the heavens dropped, the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord. The picture of this song is not God my best friend. The picture of this song is God the mighty warrior. The God who is the God of the angelic hosts. The God who can come down and decimate his enemies. The God who fears no general, regardless of how many iron chariots they have. Sisera had 900 iron chariots, terrifying to Israel. But to God, he simply needs to walk onto the field, and he has nothing to fear. The ultimate general. Now, we've got a couple songs that we pull out every once in a while. Usually, if it's a man day, we'll pull out, you know, Onward Christian Soldiers. You know, looking at us as soldiers. But there's a painful few number of songs where it says, God is the warrior. We're not as comfortable with that today. But can I tell you, when you're going through the hardest parts of your life, it is very important that you recognize that God is a warrior over every situation. That there is not a king, president, prime minister, emperor, prince, princess, queen, anyone that can stand in defiance of God. There's not one that can do it. And so when we recognize that, and when we recognize not only is God a warrior, but he fights for us, that's worth singing about. I don't need to worry because God is a warrior who's on my side, and he uses nature to do it. Again, how great thou art. We sang about that. And I see the light and the of thunder I consider all of creation. I recognize that God is over creation. We see that, notice there in verse 4, the earth trembles, the heavens drop. Yes, the clouds drop water, then later on we see it again. Because what we didn't see in chapter 4 was why did all of the chariots, why didn't they win? What happened? Because that got completely left out. But we see the picture in the song. It rained. At the exact right moment, when all of the chariots were in position, a huge torrential downpour happened, and the river, that's, it's polite to call it a river, it was probably more of a little brook or a stream, overflowed. It's actually humor there when they talk about verse 21, the torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrents, the torrent Kishon, it wasn't a mighty river. But when God decided it needed to be, it was. So if you can imagine the terror that would have been experienced with 900 iron-clad warriors in a lightning storm that causes the water to swell, it was not a good day to be with Sisera. Meanwhile, here's the Israelites up on a field with sticks, no iron whatsoever, on an elevated plain, Mount Tabor, looking down at, oh wow, the water's getting bad down there, isn't it? Oh look, lightning hit them also. Stinks to me now. God knew exactly how he was going to defeat them, and Israel sang in rejoicing that our God is a God over creation. We need to remember that when we see floods on TV. We need to remember that when the sirens go off to tell us that tornadoes are coming. We need to remember that when there's hail that's falling down 
And yes, even when there's snow that's falling from the sky, and some of us lose our minds, and the stores automatically have no more bread or milk left for anybody. Yes, we need to be prepared, but we need not fear. Our God is still in control. He's still in charge, and that's worth singing about. When you go to those beautiful areas in the world, with the Grand Canyon, the mountains, the beach, for some of you, when you see this great beauty out there, it's okay and right that music would start to well up inside of you and that you use that to praise the Lord. But there's one part in here I really need to highlight because it's an important part for us to realize. Do you notice that in the midst of this song that is about God bringing salvation and, and God being a warrior and God over creation, that there's also a refrain in the song about disappointment? Kings, they all fault. But then when we go down and we look at verse 14, we start to see a list of the clans of Israel. And some of them get praised. Ephraim, they march down. They follow Benjamin. Good job. Zebulun, yep. Ishkar, wonderful. Ishkar is faithful to Barak. Great. But then we get to Reuben. Among the clans of Reuben, there was great searchings of heart. They were thinking about it. Why did you sit still among the sheepfolds? What he's saying is, Reuben, why didn't you come? You were just enjoying the melody of sheep singing? Reuben's not the only one. Gilead, you stayed beyond the Jordan. You didn't even come to see. Dan, why'd you stay with the ship? See, Dan was situated there on the water. Why'd you stay back? You were in prime position for this. Why didn't you come? Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, stayed by the landings. In the midst of this song, recognizing God's salvation, the song deals with the fact that there is disappointment. And while, yes, God lifts up leaders and people follow, there are some who don't follow. And the reality is there's probably not a Sunday that goes by that while some people are able to sing with all their hearts, how great thou art, there are some that are in the room going, where's the song of disappointment? Because, yeah, it may be great for you right now, but for me, where I'm at, it's not great. This is why there's songs that are in minor keys. In case you don't know what that music theory, there's songs that sound sad. It's why there's a whole genre of music called the blues. Because just as it's important for us to sing God with the great major songs that uplift, there are times in our lives where disappointment is real. And it hurts, and it makes us angry, and even in this we see a curse on one city. Verse 23, it's a terrifying verse. Curse the roads, says the angel of the Lord. That was a city. Curse its inhabitants thoroughly because they did not come to the help of the Lord. It's not that God needed their help. That would be a ridiculous understanding of it. The Lord almost didn't make it because the roads didn't come. No, it's nothing like that. But curse them that when the call went out, they stayed home. You might be here today. And though we picked today some of the, the hymns of our faith that I'm sure some of you are going, ooh, this is a good, we sang real Southern Baptist songs this week. <laughs> there were some in here that probably found it very difficult to sing because right now you need a minor key song because there's disappointment in your life. It's not wrong to sing a song of disappointment. 
but don't end there. It's not the last verse. The last verse turns from disappointment and looks at the salvation that was given. It turns from that moment of life is not all good. And then it goes to Jael. Who took a hammer and a peg and used it to bring about salvation. Let's sing about how God can use a hammer and a nail. I'm sorry, a tin peg and bring about salvation. Just as we love to sing about how God used a hammer and three nails to bring our salvation. Don't stay in disappointment. Turn your eyes back to the salvation that shows you the goodness of God. Turn your eyes from the disappointment of the situation that your life is in and look to see that no matter how bad it is today, and maybe tomorrow and the day after that, maybe even worse, all of that will pale in comparison to the glory that happens when you keep your eyes focused on the one who is nailed to a cross for your sins. And sing about the salvation of God. A salvation that is very real to us and is actually painful to the rest of the world. Part of me that delights in the fact that the end of this song mocks Sisera's mother. Maybe that's my twist in this, but it's in scripture, so it must be okay, right? A mother who's waiting for her son to come home and just going, where is he at? The ladies around her go, well, he must have, he must have gotten all of the spoil from them now. And another one, he must have grabbed a bunch of women for him to be coming home. Well, you know, one or two women for every, every member of his army. Surely he's gathered them all by now. Not realizing that God's enemy has already been defeated. Brothers and sisters in Christ, can I tell you that God's enemy has already been defeated? You can already sing the victory song, even when it doesn't feel like it. Even in the face of disappointment, we can sing to the God of our salvation. We pray. Father God, I thank you. Thank you for showing us the salvation that we desperately need. Pray, Lord, that you would continue to. Burn that in front of our face. That when the very real and heart-wrenching moments of disappointment happen in our lives, they would all be tempered by the beauty of Jesus Christ and Him crucified for our sins. And when we look upon the tragedies of today, we would rightly acknowledge them as tragedies. We would still be able to say, how great is our God. Pray, Lord, that you would grant to each one here today the ability to believe that Jesus Christ has indeed already defeated their worst enemy. As sin, death, and the devil were crushed beneath the cross and empty grave of Jesus Christ. Make us mindful of that so we can sing well. For I pray this in his name. Amen. Today, if you've never publicly declared that you believe in what Christ has done for you, I invite you. As we sing this song, come and, and share that with me so that I can help you to know what it means to fully trust in Jesus Christ. But can I say that if you're going through a time of disappointment in your life, as I know a number of you in this room right now are, can your, my invitation to you, my call to you today is through the tears and the pains that you're going through, sing this last song to the Lord the giver of
your salvation. Let's stand with you. Thank you. 